Thomas McNabb podcast and I'm Thomas McNabb. Of course it would be very stupid of me to have someone else host the Thomas McNabb podcast but sometimes I am stupid so you never know. Maybe on April Fool's Day I'll have a different person talking. I think I've figured out the key to recording these podcasts. The first is to not have anybody be home. Apart from my dog. If he's home, that's fine because he, yeah. I'm not really going to pay attention. He's not going to voice his, his judgment of, of me for talking into a microphone. Um, the second key is to record it within 45 minutes of waking up. And I think I figured out why that is so good for allowing me to record a podcast. First, my voice is at this nice, relaxed, calming, monotonous level, which is not too jarring to the ears of my listeners. <laughs> And by listeners, I mean myself when I'm editing it. The second reason is, this is something I've just come up with today. Well, and by today, I mean the 40 minutes that I've been awake already. I did actually wake up once or twice, I think once at 11 a.m. From a bad dream, actually. I woke up and I said something out loud and that was what caused me to woke up. Some girl was bullying me in my dream. It's not a girl who I know from real life. It's just this made up black girl in my dream. Yeah, I said that. My dreams are very diverse. I have black people, I have gay people, I have Asian people, I have um, aliens. No, I don't know that I have aliens. I think sometimes I've dreamt about aliens. I have dogs. In this first dream, I was taste testing at a chocolate shop. And I don't know what happened, but there were groups there and this girl from one of the groups decided to single me out based on my appearance. Which kind of goes back to something that happened last night in real life. It was Halloween. And I was walking to the bus stop. And you would think on Halloween, of all the days to go out looking as normal as I do, and by normal, I mean not so normal, you would think Halloween would be the perfect day to go about unnoticed. And yet still, there was somebody who piped up and went over to their friend as I was walking past and said, ah, oh, well, whatever, look at him. It looks like a chimp. It's not the worst. Chimps are adorable. So I can live with it, but it's just, it was just like, really? 
on Halloween. I'm stood next to a guy at the bus stop dressed like a cat. A guy dressed like a cat with proper makeup on and everything and a tail. And yet, I'm the one who's being singled out. <sighs> Go figure. So I think that's obviously what that dream was about. And then in the few minutes that I was awake at 11, I started thinking about what I was going to do with my day. And I thought maybe I should go visit my grandma at her residential home. And go to bingo tonight. So I fell back to sleep. And then in my dream, me and my grandma were shopping at a market. So then I woke up about four hours later, discovered nobody's home except the dog. And I got thinking. This is usually previously twice before this has been the time when I would record a podcast and I thought why is it that I need to be in bed just after I've woken up and then I thought about all these dreams I've just had like two standout significant dreams well significant by the fact that I can re- I can recall them and it occurred to me that there must be some sort of drug in your body that is released when you're asleep that causes dreams. Like those just don't happen on their own. There must be some sort of drug inside the body. And so that drug is still present when you're waking up for the first 40 minutes. And it's really helpful Allowing me to tell stories and keep talking at a less robotic pace and move and flow from one subject to the next. They occur organically rather than me having to think of a subject and force myself to talk about it. This drug that causes dreams is allowing me to carry out a flow of organic occurring conversation in the same way that as if I were asleep, it would present all these dream images that don't really make sense when you wake up, but when you're asleep, Everything plays out naturally. You know, you can't manipulate what you do in your dreams. And if you can, then there's something quite queer about you. So as I said, last night was Halloween. I didn't do anything. The The most I got dressed up was my mum bought me a new woolly hat. So, well, a hat is made to look as if it has a pair of sunglasses on it. So, as if you just lifted up your sunglasses. So, that's literally as far as my costume went. <laughs> I just went out for hot chocolate just to relax. That's what I enjoy doing. I've finally landed upon. Speaking of organic, a schedule for the Leeds International Film Festival. Shall I tell you my method? You might not be interested, but whatever. My method is to go through all the films that are showing, 
any that sound interesting, I watch the trailer. If they don't have a trailer, sometimes I take a chance, sometimes I don't. I think I've taken some chances this year. And then I list, I put into my Google Calendar all the screenings that that one film has. Some some films have one screening, some films have two screenings. The very lucky films have three screenings. And I put all of them in. And I see what clashes, what gaps I have in between films in order to get from one screening to the next because sometimes I have to get on a bus to go to one cinema and then get on a bus to go back to another cinema so that takes about 10 minutes depending on whether or not it's a crowded bus and it usually has students on it so it usually always is crowded so I I've learned by now. So I see where the clashes are. And I create an organic path. Removing the clashes. Make leaving generous gaps to get from one screening to the next. And sometimes I have to make sacrifices. This year, I think there were nine sacrifices. No, there were eight. But two of which are films that I've already seen. So, technically, only missing out on six films. Which, by the time I go to reserve my tickets, it may be that some of these films are sold out. So it's good to have reserves. Sorry about that, I've got my tea here. <clears throat> Take my sip. I'm drinking it without milk now. You don't really need milk in red bush tea. I just had it because having tea without milk in it seemed weird. It's like one of those things, my mum really taught me how to drink tea. <laughs> that sounds so weird. <laughs> but it's true. Like, you get to about six years old, and you see your parents drinking hot drinks. You think, I want to try a hot drink. So they give you tea. She made it milk and one sugar. I don't know what age it was, but... I realised how the one sugar was one sugar too many. I didn't need sugar in my tea. So I stopped doing that. And then I realised I didn't need caffeine in my tea. So I switched to Red Bush. Naturally caffeine free. That was, it was many, many years ago, maybe eight. So after removing all the clashes, creating a path that I'm comfortable with, I've left with 45 films. The most I've ever seen at the Leeds Film Festival is 35. So... I'm being very ambitious this year. But I don't have anything else to fill my days with. Except this now. And this doesn't fill every day. I love watching films. I just love getting lost in someone else's story. I think that's probably why I like podcasts as well. You can just get lost in someone else's story for 45 minutes, 90 minutes, however long people want to talk. You just don't have to think about anything, you just let them do all the thinking and talking for you. Trouble comes when 
it's over. You walk out of a film. Then all the thoughts come back. And if it's been a good film, you know it's been a good film because you can't stop thinking about it. There are still some films from the six previous film festivals that I've been to that stick with me. Obviously the first film I ever saw wasn't that good, but it just stuck with me because it was about this boy who was on chemotherapy and he was communicating on the internet with this girl and it just like spoke to me so much, it just, it was so, I didn't know that was what the film was going to be about. So when it all unfolded, it's just it just struck a card with me, and I'll never forget it. It's called Fifty Seven Thousand Kilometers Between Us. So obviously, communicating online became a big part of my only socializing. I'm making up for it now. But you know, six years ago, short of one or two I was lucky to find a third friend. The only friends I had were online. I had one friend online. Who I would chat to. And by chat I mean instant message. We would chat almost every day. Almost every day for three straight years. By the end of those three years. I was so comfortable to having him around. It didn't matter that he was only text. He was a part of my life. As real as my parents, as real as my dog. And to go from that to nothing was very hard. But it had come to a point where I needed to forge a life for myself. It's a phrase that I use quite often. But you know, it was time to, to stop messing around and what I needed to do was appear to be I wanted my life to look attractive because as it stood six or seven years ago all I had was hospital I branched out but not in the way that I do now. It was all online. And I wanted to attract somebody into my life. To prove to them that if they were in it. It would be worthwhile. So that's why I started to make a change. I started to make changes. I got a bus pass. I got on a bus by myself for the first time. And I went to Borders. And I, said, Every, I hope everyone knows what Borders was. It was such a great hive. 
was the first place outside my house, out away from my computer that I felt comfortable. It was the first place that I bought a gay magazine. That's how comfortable I felt. It introduced me to my first Starbucks. It was my home away from home. And yet, it wasn't home. It was among strangers. And that was important in helping me get out of the house and away from the computer. So from there, I made the big leap to going to see a film by myself for the first time. The first film I ever saw by myself was Drag Me to Hell. Have you seen that film? It's such a lovely little tale. Because it's, it's not, it's not scary, it's not, I don't find it scary. It's more like a fairy tale, or, or like a, an evil, proper, ancient fairy tale, the ones that were very gruesome. I think it stars Alison Lomas. And she was in... Oh, that's, that's not important. What is important was going to the cinema by myself was a huge step. And it was so re rewarding. And below the cinema was my new home away from home, which was a, a Starbucks. And it was fortunate, because pretty soon after that, the borders folded and shut its doors forever. So luckily, if that had happened and I hadn't made those steps, I don't know what would have happened to me. Yeah, I'm trying to think, and I don't actually know whether Drag Me to Hell was the first time that I went to the cinema by myself. Yeah, it must have been. Because it sticks out in my head. But then pretty quickly after that, I discovered that Leeds had a film festival. And this lasted for about 16 days. They would show films from all over the world. Ones that struggle to get distribution over here. So for my first film festival, I was familiar with my... I was still in my cocoon. My Starbucks, the building, which with the cinema. So I only chose films from that cinema. Luckily, there was 20 of them. So for my first ever film festival, I saw 20 films. All of them. I enjoyed. I don't know what happened the next year because I only managed to see two. But the next year... I'd be going out more often. I'd even gone out on my first date. You know? And by date, I mean a man who I met online through a gay dating website. We met up in Starbucks, obviously. 
and played Scrabble. And then I watched him ride away on his bike forever. Never heard from him again. That was a huge step. So then it was kind of convoluted that I had to use online methods to meet real people, to meet real men. But I think that's just the way things are now. Is it? I feel weird, but even if I talk, I talk out loud. You know, other people will tell me that they don't know how to walk into a bar and strike up a conversation with someone and become friends. It's only ever happened to me once. Thanks to bagels. <laughs> yeah, I said bagels. I used to love bagels. There was a chocolate bagel with actual chocolate chips infused into the bagel. And I had it with Nutella. And it was warm and delicious. And I used to have it so much that the girl behind the bar serving the bagel got to know me was interested to know more about me. And so we went to a few screenings at the film festival together. And that's kind of where our friendship blossomed from. We had a lot of the same tastes in films, the same sense of humor, the same. She was a friend. That's the only friend I've made organically. Having said that, there are situations at the hospital where I go so often that the ward I'm treated on treats young cancer patients. So they're going through chemotherapy, trying to get rid of the cancer. And sometimes I make friends there, but it's a really difficult process because I'm being treated for life. I'm essentially on palliative care and they're hopefully being treated towards a goal and the goal is of getting their life back to normal and moving on away from hospital and that's what I want for them obviously because the only other option is, is not a good one but for them to move away from hospital, it's kind of difficult. Some, I feel like I'm a constant reminder of this horrible time that they went through at the hospital. So, I'm not really friends in the sense of going out on trips with anybody. But I have. I've had that. You know, it's at this point that my brain starts to think the dream drug, the dream drug, don't call it the dream drug. The dream drug wears off. And I'm starting to think now, how can I tie this in to something creative? Because I, I kind of want to keep a theme running through all the episodes where I share a little bit of my creativity or maybe a diary entry. Some things that I've written from my past. I 
And so I got to thinking when I was eight years old, I wrote my first ever song. And I remember singing it to my friend who you only ever made friends at that age through school or through people that your parents knew or from next door neighbors. You know, this was back when kids actually used to play out in the street. And despite my illness, I did play out in the street. You know, I'm lucky enough to live in Britain. So there are more days out of the year when it's cloudy and overcast. So this friend that I read, I sang, I sang my song to, was a friend of the family. Yeah, I think looking back on it, I, I didn't know about sex and being gay and all that crap. I didn't know about that when I was eight. And, but this boy who I was friends with, his opinion to me meant a lot. I was happy when I was around him. In a sense, that's kind of like your first crush, but, you know, I never saw him in that way, but looking back on it, if I'd have those feelings today, it would make me think, oh, I've got a crush. So I sang this song that I'd wrote, and it was called My Friends. I think I sang it to him and my sister, and they made fun of me, but I didn't care. This is so weird. Back then, people's opinions of me, just, I was so resilient. They just did not get to me. I was just so, so resilient, carefree. I was so envious of that, that little Tom. Struggled so hard to tap into that. He's still in there. But it's so difficult in this day and age. So I sang my song. They laughed, but I didn't care. And it even reflects that in the lyrics. I'm only going to sing for a little while. You can press the fast forward button if you want, if this part makes you feel uncomfortable. But this is my friends, the first ever song that I wrote. Some say they lie to me, some say they're not so good. My friends are my friends. And that won't change. If I know what I want, then I know what I choose. My friends, the good ones. My friends, they're the ones that I like. Cause if I know what I want, then I know what I choose. My friends, the good ones. My friends, they're the ones that I like. Cause if I know what I want, 
Then I know what I choose. Well, obviously, it was quite the apparent in my lyrics. Some say they lied to me. Some say they're not so good. Who the hell was I friends with? <laughs> if they lied to me and they're not good, then they shouldn't be my friends. That's as plain as simple. But when you're eight, you just don't care who your friends are. You'll strike up a friendship with anyone. So I guess this episode was all about friends. I haven't talked for 45 minutes yet, so I'm trying to give myself a little buffering time. I guess now we do the wind down. Guess what? I made a Facebook page. So you can like me, friends. Facebook.com forward slash Tom Sprain Pod. There is Twitter, as I said last week. The best place, the best thing for me to say is just LGB Tom. Hashtag Tom's Brain. Tom's Brain 2 at yahoo.co.uk. Maybe next week you'll hear the first ever jewel. Duel. I'm going to be perform performing a duel live on the podcast. No. What I've meant is that I may introduce the first other voice to this podcast. Speaking of friends. This is good. Thank you, Dream Drug. For carrying me through and telling this tale that I have to tell. I hope it wasn't too... What do I care? I'm doing this for me. That's what I keep telling myself, but I really do care about what you think. So get in contact. And I hope you have a good day, night, afternoon, whatever time you're listening to this. I think the best time to listen to this is at night. I like to listen to podcasts sometimes that send me off into a sleep. And I think this would be a good for some of you. I know one, one of my friends online has said that. One of my friends who I've met in real life. See? It all comes back full circle. I'm Thomas McNabb. And you've been listening to Tom's Play.